So I'm Dave Iovino. Um, so I'm going to be doing two demos for you, hopefully, today, if we don't run out of time. One based on the, the UI, which we're going to do now with the unboxing or the, what we call launch assist. And then later, one for the API, where we'll show you some, some API operations. Uh, I'm going to be doing this against a uh, simulator. There's a mock API running on my laptop. And uh, we'll be using the Navigator UI to uh, perform the launch assist. So what uh, Trey was... Um, talking about was the unboxing status. And uh, the, all the Power One functionality is exposed through the API, right? The U, anything that's available in the UI is completely built on top of the Power One API, right? There's nothing locked into the UI itself. So one of the first things when the UI, when you bring the UI up, first thing it's going to look at, it's going to make an API call and look at unboxing status. And that's what it's seeing here, right? So we're coming up here, we know that the initial deployment's not complete. Okay, so from that API call, it gets this JSON object back, it determines that it's not complete, and then it's able to, it'll take you into the launch assist to set it up. There's, there's six major stages here. We're going to go through the system acceptance, data center services, uh, the management network, storage configuration, the system fabric, which is the production network, and then deploying the vSphere platform or the uh, management cluster. I'm going to try to make this go quick because it's uh, to try to keep us on track. So... So it says they make sure you've collected all the information. Is that normally a workshop beforehand with the customer? So it's, it's a great question. So you, there, is a, uh, there is a getting started guide that could be filled out. It's a, a PDF. And typically the idea was that the, cust the, the SE or the architect or whoever would run through the customer with that. What we've actually seen, what we're actually thinking now and, and what's been um, useful is the, the, the uh, SEs can run through this with the, this, demo, this demo with the customer, collect the actual information. We have a utility, it's called a grab. It just pulls all the data down, and then we can use that to, to actually do the deployment with. Would well, you stick that in a, something like a YAML file to be built? Yep. Yeah, it's just a mix. That's all, right, it's all JSON. <laughs> Pull it back, and you can use the JSON to run the actual API calls, because everything we're going to see here is based on the API calls. Like it. All right, so I'm going to just kind of walk through this and try to get the, at least from a high level. So first thing is to accept the EULA. That's an API call there. Yeah, that's exactly what everyone does, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first thing that needs to be done when you're looking to deploy, it's been physically deployed on the site, powered up uh, after the factory. The first thing we need to do is validate the configuration, so we run a system validation. Again, this is an API call. This API call, because it's asynchronous, will result in a job being started. That job will consist of um, some Ansible playbooks uh, and some other operations that will be to go out and, and just validate the configuration, and it'll, be, it'll validate things like reachability, uh, firmware levels, to make sure all the components are ready to be installed. Okay? So we get through that process. You can get a report on that. This is just a simulator, so you don't get a very comprehensive report. Um, and then once you've done that, the next thing now I need to start inputting uh, my data center services. All right, and this is organizational name, and I'm going to kind of try to blow through this pretty quick since it's, it's not really all that interesting. Okay. So the, the UI here is helping me collect the data. Okay. I also need a, a subdomain, a DNS subdomain for Power One. And I need at least one DNS server. I won't bother configuring the rest of it. And SNMT. <coughs> so I get to this stage. The data is collected. The, the UI, what it's going to do is going to build the JSON object for you and then just post it to the, to the API, which we could do ourselves, right? We could use it, as somebody had mentioned earlier. We could, we could have did this in a YAML, convert it to JSON, and write it to the API. Again, it's going to take a, a varied amount of time, depending on the number of components. It's an asynchronous operation. I post it to the API, I get a job ID back, I, tr I just simply track and look at the logs from the job ID to see when it's finished. Okay. All right, two steps out of the way. Now I need to configure the management network to be able to reach the components. Okay. As Trey was saying earlier, we don't actually configure the customer's environment, but uh, 
for the switches, but we need, to know, we need this information so we can put in our port maps. Uh, management connectivity uplinks are either 10 or 40 gig uplinks for management network. Okay. Uh, it's a layer three handoff between, the cust between us and the customer, so we need to we'll configure point to point links here. Oops. <coughs> For the management network, I can do BGP, OSPF, or uh, static routes. This is powered by ON, ON IE, correct? Yes, yep. So, put in my BG, BGPAS number. Now, in the management networks, there are some reserved networks that are down here, that show you here, the different um, Power One reserved networks. But there are some networks that can be reconfigured or are deployed at the time of uh, this, uh, of the deployment time, right, of launch assist. So these you can change. I'm just going to leave them as the defaults here. Okay. So one of the interesting things to note about this is we've already built this in the factory. We've yeah. actually given private addresses to the system in the factory. Part of this workflow is actually readdressing everything to the customer's stated Correct. desired values. So there's a little bit of magic that goes in to make sure that we can keep everything running while we readdress everything. Okay. So again, we, we reached the stage here where we've collected, we've used the wizard to collect all the data. We hit, we hit start configuration job, which again, another API call, post the JSON there. We get a job ID back, it runs asynchronously, runs a bunch of Ansible playbooks. Um, when, the configure, when the management network has been configured, which runs a lot quicker on the demo than in real life, right? What would happen if this failed? Is there like an ability to roll back to the you would uh, or? Today, you're going to need some help from okay. service to, to roll it back, but you can roll it. You can roll it back, but you're going to need some assistance. Okay. okay. So Is the it? next stage. I'm, it runs a bunch of checks before it does the configuration, or no? Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, so the next thing here is the Power One DNS servers, right? So we have some internal DNS servers because we're going to provide resolution for that subdomain we create. So you're going to you're going to refer to us for those, and then the three uh, the three service endpoints that are going to be relevant right out of the box are the navigator, the API, and then the logging service, right? So you can go and look take a look at your the Power One logs. Next one is the storage configuration. Here's where we, this is a, needs a little bit of manual assistance. You've configured as uh, earlier on in the management networks, we configured the, the storage management domain, uh, I mean networks, and so now all these IP addresses need to be applied to the PowerMax. That still today requires the services to do it. So there's no day zero to API today for PowerMax. Correct. Right. You cannot provision network services, you cannot, uh, act, you, uh, programmatically deploy authentication services with digital certificates. It's one of the things that we house here to ensure that this is all done securely. So all of that stuff needs to be done by a service technician at the console, and we do that in the factory. So once that's been done, then we just simply need to discover the PowerMax array. Not be generated in, at the PO time? Yes. By the way, one of the things I should state is this year you will see us introduce mid-range storage, and Unity does have those uh, uh, those day zero APIs, and so it will be fully automated with the mid-range. All right. So the uh, the next thing we need to do is configure the system fabric, which would be the production network, which is the leaf spine we talked about earlier, and uh, how you'd actually the customer would access its workload their workloads. Similar configuration here, right? We need to define the port map the connectivity so that we can, uh, for our port maps, this connectivity can be either 10, 100, 10 40, or 100 gig uplinks to, for the production network. L3 handoff, point-to-point -point links need to be configured. Is 
obviously some error football. handling there, yeah. <laughs> type stuff wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a bad day if you mess this stuff up. So we, we do the error handling for that. <laughs> um, as far as connecting this up, uh, or the handoff to the customer can either be static handoff or you can do BGP. Okay. All right, so we've collected the information here. Again, we're going to make an API call. It's going to kick off a job that's going to run a, a, a bunch of automation that's going to go out and perform all this, all these st steps. Did you measure how much time usually takes to, to do all of this manually? Yes. And, uh, yeah, so you were saying earlier, I think you said four hours. This takes, time. for automation, it takes four hours. Four hours, yeah. from, from a manual perspective, um, oh, I, would yeah. I would characterize VBlock as being the best in class in the world for doing it in a manual fashion. It's two to three days in the factory to logically build a, factor, uh, a system, and then it's at least two days on site to do what's called uh, a DNI. Considering that I'm, so I don't care about the, your two days in factory, but only on, on my two days, it, so we are doing all of this only to save... Uh, uh, five days worth of time in a VBlock. Five no, days worth two of days time. in my data center. Yes, you said. I mean, so so it, it's important to understand a V block. So we do logical build in the factory for V block. We take right. in customer requirements. Right. We, we, we are we are comparing with other com, uh, converted infrastructure. Six months. To build this on your own on on site, it'd be uh, customers anywhere from three to six months to build this, coordinating all the various different te uh, technology teams. You know, is it, is typically what we see when customers build their own. No. Well, so if I get, you know, the, all the resources and I issue a, a PO, okay, and I have all the component in my data center, mm -hmm. and excluding, uh, you know, that I need one month to get the power uh, <laughs> to the rack, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, excluding all the facility yeah. problems, all the organizational problems, so as soon as all the connections are in place, okay, because this is... The same case. I mean, if I don't have the Ethernet cables, I don't have them yep. for everything. So the day I start working on configuring day zero operation on hardware installed, okay, for all of this, because if it's four hour with all the automations, how much does it take to configure manually all of this? Um, Consider that we are weeks. talking about the rack here. And the our experience is weeks. There's a, there's a certain amount of which version of software are we going to run, which best practices are we going to deploy when we configure it, when we deploy this particular version, what dependencies does it have. All of that stuff has to be discovered in real time through diagnosis and meetings unless you have a predetermined standard that you've deployed it once and you know precisely how you're going to deploy it the next time, then I, it's still well, at least a week. Know, okay. Well, uh, this, this leads to a long discussion. I mean, we are, we are talking about large data center. This is not a, a, an SME that says, oh, look, there is a power one, let's buy it. No? So we are thinking about a, an enterprise customer probably buying this instead of EV block or, or, a, or, a, or the individual components. Yeah. We are a, uh, and they are doing this, uh, you know, the same model, the same. and. Uh, so we, we are automating the installation process, and most of it, uh, uh, it's, you know, latest firmware. So are you telling me that you are checking all the firmwares in the connectors, which is everything, every time? Every and if there is a new patch, you download the patch, because I don't, don't see anything of it. Uh, and, uh, and you check that the VMware, because you didn't even start and seeing, I don't know, which version of VMware yeah, are you installing here? It's coming, it's coming. What would you yeah, but, but you already installed everything. Yeah. How, how do you know? <clears throat> how do I know? So what we're asking is, would you not want to start with deciding on what platform of VMware you're, or vSphere you're going to be using, 6, 6, 5, 6, 7 or whatever, which are going to have different system requirements, different best practices to be The followed. unboxing experience is not dependent on, a, we're just getting the system up to a state where you can then make those decisions. So this is this is the act of installing this, this the underlying infrastructure. This installs vSphere in a minute. Or? It will. It will. <clears throat> yes. The, yeah. the short answer is for the initial build, we use a standard version of 6.7. So those 
that kind of in the gate standards for the initial <coughs> that, that yes. has so you, you are putting requirements that are very very strict requirement to make it work which is how we draw the straight line through the automation okay right. what happens yeah. if the meantime uh, there is a patch on uh, uh, 6.7 that I need to install because there is a security and it compromises something else in the, in the, in the entire process. That, that's where we get on to the lifecycle assist conversation because if you deploy it with version 1.0 then that establishes the, the, the kind of the, the beachhead of the system then once you can apply new system standards to that then that's where you can start to apply upgrades depending on what the platform is that you've deployed. This is, this is, again, I don't know if you saw the unboxing experience of getting the initial platform deployed and integrated into the customer okay. environment. Sorry for my skepticism, but, yeah. uh, but uh, it's, <coughs> I don't know, in my experience, you know, you, you need to know what is the last company you're going to install and manage to install the first one. And, and you have to do everything according <laughs> And mm. in this case, you are installing everything. <coughs> the only thing that you can install is this. In the meantime, VMware has released 25 patches. Mm -hmm. And you didn't check them. We, we, we actually do. Let's get through the unboxing experience and yeah. oh, it'll become more clear. Do you need to deploy a new vCenter? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. We do deploy a vCenter. So the only thing that what gets deployed in the last, the last step here is the management cluster, right? So we deploy the management cluster. Uh, install vSphere 6.7, and we deploy um, a bunch of uh, VMs, including the management vCenter, the production, the workload vCenter, NSX, and a few other things. So we're deploying all of the management for the VMware cloud uh, in a four-server cluster that we're building mm -hmm. with external storage attached in yep. this last step. So this would be like a VVD. So the payload mm -hmm. to be delivered is inside that management plane yep. at right. the, from the factory integration? So that's where you have all the tools and tool mm -hmm. sets, et cetera, et cetera? Correct. Okay. So the last step is to deploy this management cluster. All right. So as, as Trey was saying, it's four nodes. This is actually the step that takes the longest because you're deploying, you're doing a deploy OS on each of the four nodes, mm -hmm. and there is a throttled you know, OS install time for each of the nodes per vSphere install procedure. Are these bare metal servers? They are bare metal. Running Linux, whatever. Yeah, and there's error handling to deal with any sort of timeouts with deploy OS images, things like that. All right, so once the, once the management server, or the VC management cluster has been deployed, um, the, the unboxing experience is complete, and we, this is essentially where you would start. Now, this, the, the, the simulator has two clusters, this DevOps and production uh, CR, CRG, a term you'll learn later, um, in there. But really, you, the only thing you'd have is the management CRG there, which would be the, the vSphere management. So we orbit, and this is where we'll pick up our next demo later. Yeah, so we orbit our release matrices off of uh, a particular cloud outcome. In this case, the, the environment that we're deploying is VMware. Are you going to do next? 6.7. And so all of the firmware and release compatibility orbits off that. Um, we facilitate through Lifecycle Assist the ability to upgrade VMware 6.7 to whatever release. And if there are any dependent firmware releases for that update, then we will deploy those updates in the Lifecycle Assist. And you can do those individually, or you can do them in succession, or we provide instructions so you can do them manually if some uh, customer environment does not want automation to deploy that particular software update. We'll provide the instructions on how to execute it. 